we had people uh, embody a piece of coral on a virtual coral reef um, and experience the process of ocean acidification. Um, and we found that people felt, felt greater empathy uh, and felt closer to the cause after they had had that experience. This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers brought to you by the Fur Bears. How do you grow empathy and protect the future for non-human animals in a part of the world most people will never visit? One company has the answer and the science to back it up. Crikey, a mobile gaming company founded by John V. and Kedeki Shriram, recently partnered with the Ellen Fund to launch Gorillas, a 3D augmented reality game that allows people to learn about the lives of critically endangered mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Now, what makes this fascinating is not just the adorable graphics and enjoyable gaming aspect, but that it's backed up by scientific evidence that indicates the augmented reality experience actually grows empathy in adults. Despite my best efforts, I am unable to succinctly explain the various aspects of what John V. and Kadeki Shriram have created with Crikey. So let's dive into the interview with these two incredible people and hear why I'm telling others that they may have developed one of the tools that could actually change the hearts and minds of humankind. I guess it's it's a chicken and egg question, or maybe a gorilla and bamboo question. Does that work? I don't think it translates, but nonetheless, which came first, the idea for this app or the proposal to um, support Mountain Gorillas and the Ellen Fund? Like how, how did those two components sort of come together? Yeah, this is John B. So definitely uh, the app came first before the uh, the gorillas. Um, Kit, we can do a, some quick bios and a, an intro of the company. Um, so I'm John V, CEO of Crikey. I uh, grew up in the Bay Area and went to college here. We moved down to LA for film school and then went to uh, work at YouTube for a few years. Came back for an MBA at Stanford and Kitiki had been there the whole time doing her PhD. And so we started talking in our last year before graduation about starting a company together um, and decided to go into AR. And I'll let Kitiki do an intro of herself and a brief intro of the company. Sure. Hey, this is uh, Kitiki. I'm the chief technology officer here at Crikey. I got my PhD at the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab in 2017. Um, my research is more on the technical side of virtual and augmented reality. And uh, while I was there, I worked a little bit at Oculus and then um, also at Google on the Glass team. And the company is called Crikey. Uh, we're a mobile augmented reality gaming app where multiple users can connect in real time to play AR games with friends. Uh, we launched in October on iOS and Android. Um, and to date, we worked with uh, Sony Pictures for their film Goosebumps uh, and with the Ellen Fund. And in both those cases, uh, we built them uh, custom multiplayer AR games uh, for Goosebumps with Goosebumps villains uh, as the characters and for the Ellen Fund uh, featuring a, a baby mountain gorilla. And when we started the company, um, we did start with this idea of wanting to promote conservation. And so the very first iteration of the app, um, we had a bunch of animals, including lion, a manta ray, a uh, baby elephant. And the idea was that uh, users could place these animals into their room through their phone camera and um, interact with them. It was definitely challenging at first. Uh, one, to get the technology right, and then two, to promote this idea of conservation. We had lots of young users thinking the manta ray was a spaceship, and so there was definitely some <laughs> uh, messages lost in translation there. Um, so we, as the company evolved, moved into gaming and realized that gaming was a really neat way, channel to get people engaged in a topic or with a character, with the, an object in the camera. And um, as we started doing that after the Goosebumps partnership, we were able to get in touch with the Ellen Fund, and they had just started this initiative to save the gorillas after Portia gave Ellen her 60th birthday gift as, as the foundation. And uh, they were looking for ways to engage her fans. And to, not all of her fans would be able to travel to Rwanda to actually go trekking with the mountain gorillas, um, but they really wanted to find a way beyond pictures and videos for their fans to engage with the emotion and the empathy that... Um, they felt when they f started the foundation. And so we, uh, c with working with them, constructed this idea of uh, building an AR forest and uh, 
not just the the baby gorilla in the forest in terms of the 3D models, but also the soundscape of what does it feel like to actually walk through the forest. And uh, so that was sort of where the uh, idea originated and uh, what where, where it's come to be today. It's it's so I gotta say I downloaded the game and there's a baby gorilla in my kitchen right now sitting on top of my dog or there was I think it may have left um, and it is a lot of fun to click through and play um, I was expecting uh, my I should say my so augmented reality well, we're gonna have to get into that uh, but my only experience to date with actual augmented reality was uh, the Pokemon game and the um, the sticker feature on my phone where you can add like a stormtrooper to a photo which I, I got to admit, took up two weeks of my life. Um, <laughs> so this, I, th- I was kind of expecting the same thing. And when I loaded the app and I loaded the game, so oh, there's cool, a little globe. And then, oh, we're zooming in. And oh, there's a gorilla. And then bamboo shoots started coming up from the floor. And an anthill appeared. And the sound started. And it's a like a, a fully, fully immersive experience, uh, which is really impressive. And... Uh, really enjoyable just to see, but let alone the gaming aspects of it, let alone the education aspects of it, visually, just from a sensory point of view, it's a very enjoyable game. Um, And I'd like to talk a little bit about two aspects here. Um, One is what augmented reality is, and the other is the game design or game theory behind this. I heard an interview on the Ologies podcast with Ali Ward uh, featuring Dr. Jane McGognigal, I believe, um, who does a whole bunch of gaming type things. And I learned the very, very basics of game theory and how it's, it's, it's a lot more involved, I guess, than I ever would have expected. So before we get into the game side of it, let's talk about augmented reality and what that is and how that technology works, because I think there may be a number of people in the audience who haven't heard of it or haven't experienced it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is uh, Kedeke speaking, and the idea of augmented reality is that we're overlaying uh, virtual or digital objects onto the physical world environment. Um, And how is this different from virtual reality? I think that's an important distinction. So uh, with VR, uh, you do need to have a headset. Um, When you put the headset on, it's a fully 3D world. So the physical world is is not involved at all. Um, However, with AR, uh, you can do it off your phone or off of a headset, and it's integrated directly with the physical world. And uh, to us at Crikey, that was really compelling because we wanted people to be able to experience uh, nature and these beautiful animals um, in the context of their own life um, to really drive home that sense of empathy and understanding that, uh, you know, we're existing here today. And then in Rwanda, there are mountain gorillas coexisting here today as well. It's like I said, it's a very, from a sensory point of view, it's very, uh, I can't even think of the right word. It's just, it's very impressive. That's, that's the, the word that I keep coming back to. And I apologize for the sounds you're hearing right now. That is JJ pacing around behind me because I am gesticulating wildly. And that normally means we're going to play. Um, <laughs> no problem. I actually want to um, have Kedeke speak a little bit further to her PhD research and how that led us to wanting to do conservation-based augmented reality. Because uh, her research has shown uh, an impact on people's behavior and perception towards the environment really? after experiencing, ha- after having an immersive experience. And so I'll let her speak to that. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So uh, w- when I was getting my degree in our lab, we did a lot of work around how do immersive experiences, particularly with nature, natural environments, um, affect people's physical world attitudes and behaviors. And uh, we saw in a number of instances that even short periods of immersion inside of virtual reality could actually change people's attitudes towards nature. Um, A couple examples that come to mind. So uh, in one study, uh, we had people um, cut down uh, a virtual tree um, and we would ask them afterwards uh, to do sort of a a series of of tests in the physical world. And um, we found that they actually used uh, less paper resources after they had had the experience of cutting down a tree in virtual reality and understanding that that is where paper comes from. Um, and that's that's one example. Um, another example is that uh, we had people uh, embody a piece of coral on a virtual coral reef um, and experience the process of ocean acidification. Um, and we found that people felt, felt greater empathy uh, and felt closer to the cause after they had had that experience. And so thinking about this idea where uh, virtual experiences can actually be quite effective at transforming the way people view nature or experience things that they cannot actually experience in their day-to-day lives, if we take that and translate that to mobile augmented reality, I think, think it's exciting for a couple of reasons. One is that 
um, we can really enable people to have accessible experiences. Um, that was a key reason why we decided to do uh, augmented reality off the phone at Crikey. We felt that we wanted lots and lots of people to be able to experience this um, with very low barriers to access. And then two, we wanted to build high fidelity experiences through the phone that would actually transport people to locations uh, they can't actually visit every day. Um, and I think the Gorilla Game is a great example of that because not everyone can go uh, to Rwanda right away, but at least they can experience um, this version of it and have uh, a customized experience with the gorilla. Well, and I think that's that sort of plays into the whole concept of using this kind of technology is that going to Rwanda is not an everyday thing for most people, I think, uh, unless you happen to live in Rwanda. So it it, it certainly is um, an experience. And I'm fascinated too in, is there any I, I, in your study of this, I'm stumbling all over the place because I'm so fascinated by this. Um, during your work on this concept of using VR and AR for conservation, uh, was there any kind of sociological or psychological components of the study trying to identify what the, I suppose, the fulcrum is? Like, at what point are they saying, like, is there a switch getting thrown from I'm I'm experiencing this this environment to... I can maybe do better or to, oh, I never thought of it that way. What's causing that switch to get thrown, do you think? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So there's a few different measures that can be used to identify um, sort of the moment where um, attitudes shift or, or people feel compelled to take action. So um, the first type of measurement is uh, biometrics. So um, we often collect data on uh, people's skin conductance, their heart rate during the experience. Um, the second type of uh, measurement is movement. So we can track uh, how people are moving during a virtual experience, um, where they're looking um, during the course of the experience. Um, and then lastly, we also do use survey questions, um, both multiple choice and also qualitative. So just an interview talking to somebody. And when you correlate all those measures together, it does give you a good sense of what exactly in the experience is motivating people or, or moving people to action. And um, in general, the research indicates that um, when people have embodied experiences with novel avatars, so in other words, embodying someone or something that is not like you in the physical world, um, taking on that new perspective can actually um, lead to a higher likelihood of attitude change after the experience. So what you're saying, uh, more or less, is that the two of you have figured out how to save the world. That's what I'm hearing, at least. I don't know if we figured it out yet. Uh, we hope to. We hope that what we're trying to build here uh, contributes to that in some way. I don't know that any one thing can solve for that, but uh, our our hope is to continue to build nature based AR experiences um, that can help people connect or use their phone as a window back into the natural world. Um, everyone's always so uh, zoned in on that little screen, but if it can open up, uh, you know, a forest or a new ecosystem or habitat, I think it helps people reconnect with nature in a new uh, way. Absolutely. And these are conversations I have with people uh, sort of in my field of nonprofit advocacy and uh, wildlife and conservation regularly is how do we get people connected? So for example, I live in the middle of an urban center. Uh, I compare uh, Hamilton to uh, Pittsburgh frequently for American friends. Uh, it's a very similar kind of vibe and city style. So there is nature nearby, but it's not in your face every day. And we're asking people to change their lives to help something that they're not really connected to. Uh, on top of that, I literally posted two days ago after reading a book by Dr. Uh, Isha Akhtar called um, uh, Our Symphony with Animals, which I'm going to be talking with her about soon. Uh, my post was, how do we grow empathy? Because as children, we seem to kind of naturally have it, and then we grow out of it. And... What I'm getting kind of a feel for talking to the two of you and having experienced this game and done a bit of reading about it is that you're growing empathy in adults. And as someone who spends most of his time reading and looking at the horrible things human beings do to animals and each other, it, it is genuinely putting tears in my eyes to think of that concept, that ability to make people, to have people experience something other than themselves. Um, it's 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 damn near miraculous. Uh, so I think that's something the the both of you should be and I probably are extraordinarily proud of. Uh, but I can say from our perspective, we're extremely grateful for because uh, this is just the beginning too, right? It's like how how far could this go? 
what's next in regards to AR and VR and how we interact with nature? Are there big sky high plans at this point or is it seeing how things go? Thank you. And and definitely, I mean, even for us, we often are so heads down in, in building these experiences, we don't get to see the impact that it has on people. We just a couple of weeks ago, were at a conference and got to demo the gorillas game to, to a few people. And uh, some of the women were brought to tears the first time they held that phone and sat next to the baby gorilla on the ground in the middle of the street. And it was uh, impressive for us to see the, that our work was able to emotionally touch people in that way. And I, it's definitely been inspiring for us to see that, and uh, we we hope to continue. We do have a couple other nature projects coming up uh, this year that we'll definitely let you know about as as their uh, release dates come come up. Um, from our perspective, we want to continue to explore uh, how this project has impacted people. And so, if anyone has played the game and really loved it or had an experience that they want to share with us. We're, we always welcome people to email us at support at crikey.com and share those stories uh, because that's inspiring to our team. It helps us know uh, what parts of this experience are really meaningful to people and um, how could we build it better next time um, for the next animal project that we work on. Uh, I think in our world, we're trying to find ways to continue to get people to stay in experiences, come back to uh, the, the experience multiple times, to share it with their friends. Um, and that is really how this message spreads and how we can continue to uh, get more people to connect with nature in, in their own way. Um, and the beauty of it is it's really a customized experience because the gorilla in the game has its own AI. So uh, as a user playing the game, you can't actually control the gorilla. When you tap on it, nothing happens. You can interact with the bamboo and the termite mounds in the experience, um, but we want the animals in all of our experiences to have their own agency. Uh, and so there's no way that the user could ever control them, um, which means that as you're walking around in our games, uh, the animals can do different things and they have uh, they will take their own path as it, as it is. Uh, so anytime somebody comes in, there's, they have a, a very different experience uh, interacting with the animal and the environment. And that, it also, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I just talked with Dr. Mark Beckoff about his book, uh, Unleashing Your Dog. And we taught out one of the big feed, one of the big elements of that is agency uh, for non-human animals in our lives is giving them that ability to choose. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just, again, it's another absolutely wonderful thing to hear about this game. It's getting kind of ridiculous at this point, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, even for us, as we were designing it, we're, we're like, will this translate? Will it feel real? Um, because obviously all of these are 3D digital objects, uh, but we want them to have that feeling of, of reality to the extent possible. And um, the other thing that I was going to mention is that as you're playing the game, whenever you open up the, the camera, it will look at your surroundings, see, you know, where is the ground, where are the tables, and the forest will grow uh, differently based on your surroundings. The forest will grow as you walk down the hall of your home or walk down the street, uh, and it will sprout as you're walking, which is really beautiful to see. Uh, and I think it, as we continue to develop the game and add updates to it, there's more and more that we're able to do on the technology side um, to make the game experience even better and so we're really excited to to continue to do that it is it's it, it's actually i was just thinking it's kind of like a child's imagination um watching all of the elements come together on my phone screen or tablet screen reminds me of visualizations of how a young child with a creative mind sees the world around them uh that's just it's another little anecdotal side thing and of course people who do want to send you stuff can also rate and review on itunes or the google play store um because as someone who does podcasts i am trained to say that at least twice an episode <laughs> thank you yes thank please you. If, if people you know love the experience and and want to encourage a, a good review always helps us feel better and, and want to work harder and do better uh with the projects that we're working on and um, that we would very much appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> now, in terms of the gaming aspect of this, um, uh, as I said, I have a very, 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 very basic understanding of game theory and how it kind of applies to different things now, but I, it's not nearly good enough to explain to anyone, uh, barely myself, uh, because I just listened to someone else talk about it. So I actually don't have an understanding, but tangent. So anyway, um, 
how how did you decide how people would interact with this? Because it's it's one thing to have sort of an exploratory environment, um, which is something I think that is around now, right? Is sort of just explore this maze or explore, um, you know, this hidden island full of annoying mist on a CD-ROM in the 1990s. And uh, a very specific generation is going to love that joke. And um, how, how did you decide what it's going to be like for the user? Other than sort of what, once we get past the environment, past the, the messaging, how do you decide what the game is? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. This is, uh, this is Kedeke speaking. And I think there were kind of two things that we wanted to take into consideration. So the first was, you know, what is, what is the goal of this experience in the perspective of the user, which is we want them to experience what it's like to be in a virtual Rwandan forest trying to survive much as a real gorilla would have to. And then the second consideration was, how do we bring in sort of unique elements of augmented reality gameplay uh, to make this experience replayable and interesting? Um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So one of the things that we've learned is that the, the most important thing with mobile AR in particular is that for the experience to be meaningful in augmented reality, it needs to require people to move around a little bit. Um, so this is not you know, a seated game where people can just you know, sit on their couch to really engage with the forest. Um, you have to get up and walk around. Um, and to encourage this, as you're walking, you'll notice that the forest actually grows with you. So the more you walk around your living room or, or down the street, um, the more forest there is. And when you turn around, you can actually see it. So the, the play area gets larger and larger. Um, and similar to the actual forest, um, only certain stretches of the forest will have bamboo and only certain stretches will have termite mounds. And uh, we wanted to encourage um, two different types of interaction um, with these food sources. And one of the one of the keys to gameplay success is uh, variability, both in, in visuals and in gameplay mechanics, so that uh, users feel challenged to try and achieve their goals. So, for example, with the termite mounds, you tap to break them and then have to tap fairly quickly to collect the termites. And with the bamboo, you have to pull it down as though you're going to snap it, just like the, the real gorillas do in Rwanda. Um, and you have to release it at just the right time to actually get the full benefit of the berries that are falling down from it. Um, and we wanted to include those two different mechanics so that users felt like there was variability in the experience and like there is a challenge um, to collecting food. Survival is not always going to be easy. It, it's what, so, okay, so something that I'm interested by is the, the concept of survival. Uh, and again, I'm coming at this, so I'm, I'm just trying to think of the best way. I have often thought about um, animals, non-human animals in virtual worlds. So uh, for example, I haven't played the new Red Dead Redemption game because of killing animals in it. It's something I'm not comfortable with. But I've had conversations with game designers and with young people who are gamers uh, and with animal rights activists. And there's this weird balance people have. And everyone's a little different on, well, it's just a game or uh, no, it's representative of something else. So how do you raise stakes in a game where you're trying to encourage people to have empathy for a creature in a place without having negative consequence, I guess, or without having... Uh, indirectly violent consequence to the individuals in the game. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm I'm running in a circle in my brain trying to come up with this question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, for us, for us, the answer to that question is that um, you know, one, we don't want people to be able to control the gorilla. Um, we don't want the game to involve petting the gorilla in any way. Um, this this animal is a wild animal and it should be left free. We want people to observe it, but not to not to invade its face or, or harm it in any way. Um, and then two, thinking about the, the survival element, for us, survival in, in this game meant really what it means to to be a, a, a vegetarian gorilla in, in Rwanda, which is, you know, simply the act of collecting food. And um, we hope to make that interesting and and still just as, as compelling as, as some of the other games you mentioned, um, simply by introducing a timed component to the game. So uh, you have an energy bar in the game, and the closer it goes to zero, um, the closer you are to having the game be over. Um, and so we hope that that time component would add that same sense of urgency that, that people might feel in other games, um, but without any of the, the sort of uh, violent actions that you mentioned earlier. And there's no graphic violence or anything in the game either. It's uh, more of a smooth transition to the next stage of uh, 
finishing your video because you get a an edited highlight reel of your gameplay after you finish the game, uh, which you can share with friends um, or on your social media after. And so uh, users can either choose to exit the game early or if the hunger bar or energy meter goes down to uh, zero, then uh, you get gently moved over to the highlight reel section of the app. Awesome. Uh, and for, I imagine you, you probably often talk to parents and educators about this. Uh, what kind of age range are you looking at? Is this something that, you know, I would download for my 14 year old little brother? Is it something that uh, my sister would download for her 10 week old son? Uh, probably not, but it's the first thing that jumped into my head. Um, or is it sort of an all ages experience other than previously mentioned nephew who can barely lift his head? <laughs> Definitely, we want it to be uh, something that families can experience together. Um, our app is uh, gated to 13 plus based on uh, legal regulations. So when you sign up to create an account, uh, you you must be 13 or older, uh, and that's mostly for uh, based on the, the laws in the U.S. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but um, we have had people who are young teens all the way to uh, adults come in and enjoy this experience in different ways. Um, some people love to come in and just sit with the gorilla and um, stay with the gorilla the whole time rather than playing the game. And others want to come in and play the game and see how long they can stay in the forest and uh, continue to tap on termite, mon termite mounds and bamboo. Uh, so people of all ages come in and experience this in different ways. Um, and we hope that they leave feeling something meaningful and feeling an empath empathy connection with the ecosystem and the gorilla. And what was it like, I have to ask, when you uh, <laughs> you went into partnership with the Ellen Fund? I mean, I, I know running a company, any sale, any new contract is exciting. What's it like when it's, you know, for Ellen's birthday? <laughs> it, well, it was very exciting for us. We're a small startup, um, and so this was a very big project for us. Uh, the Ellen Fund team has been really kind and wonderful to work with, and they genuinely care about the cause and want to find ways to help her fans to connect with gorillas in uh, new ways using technology. And so uh, they were very kind to work with us on developing the concept of the game and um, sharing it out on social media. And so we've been. Uh, very grateful to them for their belief in us as a team um, and working with us on building the experience. To learn more about Crikey, visit crikey.com. That's Crikey with two Ks. Or look up the app on the Google Play Store or iTunes Store. It really is a ton of fun. And to learn more about the Ellen Fund and the incredible conservation work they're doing, visit theellenfund.org. That's the show for this week, and I want to thank all of you for listening. This interview was a ton of fun for me to do, and I really hope that comes across. Doing this show means a lot to me, and it means a lot to all of us at the Fur Bears. So thank you for listening. And if you want to show how much you enjoy the show, here's two things you can do. Pick either, pick none. I'm happy either way. First, go to patreon.com slash Defender Radio. You can directly support the Fur Bears and this program with a $1 a month gift. That's 25 cents an episode, pretty much. All you have to do is go to patreon.com slash Defender Radio, punch in your information, and we'll get a small gift from you every month. It's great, too, because it allows me to give you exclusive access to some content. Uh, for example, I wrote a, a small blurb last week about my birthday and some mental health issues I've been experiencing. Sometimes you'll see funny pictures of JJ or hear me having full conversations with her while I'm trying to record things, as well as outtakes like two birds fighting inches from my window while I was interviewing PJ Smith several weeks ago. So that's patreon.com slash Defender Radio. Now, the other thing you can do that means a lot is going to your preferred podcast app, whether that's iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, Player FM, one of the many, and leaving a rating and review of the show. That makes it easier to find for others when they're looking for content. And in turn, that helps us communicate our compassionate views to others, our solutions, our interviews, and more. So again, rate and review, join us at patreon.com slash Defender Radio, or just follow me on social media. I'm at Defender Radio on Facebook and Twitter, and at Howie Michael on Instagram. Sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything you do, for the animals, for this show, and for yourselves.
You matter, and I hope you know that. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio and the Fur Bears, reminding you to be kind and to stay informed and stay strong. Mm-hmm.